So welcome back. We have session on modern PostgreSQL for AE applications. Dee and Umar will tell us how to extend PostgreSQL for better life or something like that. So, please. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming. So today we're going to talk about building uh, AI applications uh, with Postgres, um, both the extension part of it uh, and the cloud services are two key components uh, of bringing that experience. So we have a joint uh, session today. Uh, so Lantern uh, will, is an open source Postgres vector database, so that covers the extension side, and UbiCloud is an open source alternative to AWS so, uh, on the cloud side. So we'll talk about uh, both of those during the call. But first, I'll let uh, perhaps Dee start with an intro. Oh. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dee. Um, uh, I uh, met uh, Umer and the rest of the Ubi Cl Cloud team at YC. And um, before that, uh, I worked at Facebook on the ads ranking team. Um, and yeah, uh, working on Lantern now. Uh, Lantern is uh, building Postgres for AI applications. Thanks, Dee, and I'm Umur, one of the co-founders and co-CEO uh, of uh, UbiCloud. Uh, before UbiCloud, I was one of the founders at Citus Data, uh, which is a distributed Postgres uh, database. Perhaps just a quick orientation, who here is familiar with, with Citus? All right, so more than half the crowd, uh, with some very familiar faces, of course. Uh, but um, yeah, so that was our uh, kind of first deep foray into, into Postgres world. Uh, Citus Data was acquired by Microsoft, and after that, uh, I ran the uh, Azure uh, Postgres uh, product side together with uh, Özgün, who led the engineering side, and a lot of the team from our Citus days are here with us kind of at UbiCloud. And before starting UbiCloud, I went uh, back to Y Combinator as a partner where I worked with, uh, say, the new generation of founders, uh, which I was delighted to meet Deed, and, and we're kind of full circle. Uh, here. Um, so uh, today we have a packed agenda. Uh, we'll try to cover all of it in, in 50 minutes, but the first part is really uh, building an LLM chatbot, uh, taking an external data set, a code base, uh, and then uh, doing that in less than 15 minutes. So we'll actually uh, dive uh, into how that happens. And then taking that as a kind of a toy application, but something that is directionally hopefully relevant, then we say, okay, how does this scale to much larger data sets to real world kind of production applications? So that's the first section where D will take us through that. And then the uh, latter part, I'll talk about, okay, how to integrate what we talked about into your existing setup and along the way, what's a good way to, and also a bit of a new way uh, of running extensions uh, with, with Postgres and this being uh, PGConf Europe uh, figured, hey, the privacy and data locality is, is an important part of the story, especially uh, as it gets to AI. So we'll cover that as, as kind of a concluding remarks. Right, and we'll look to take most of the questions at the end because there's a lot of topics, but if there's something very kind of burning or if we're kind of really key for the understanding of for everyone, please uh, you know, chime in, but otherwise we'll bucket the questions uh, at the end. But that? Um, cool. Uh, thanks, Umer. Uh, I'll start with part one, which is uh, building an LLM chatbot with Postgres. Um, so uh, to start, uh, let's just talk a bit about ChatGPT. It's really good at generating answers. Uh, you can ask it to uh, create a calculator app in React or something, and it does a great job. Um, but there's a few common issues with it. Uh, one is that it often doesn't have good answers for new or frequently updating data. So, for example, a new code base or uh, a code base that changes quite often. Um, it doesn't have access to private data, and um, it often ha hallucinates. So it just makes up an answer to a question, but is very confident about it. Um, so we can illustrate this with an example of asking ChatGPT a question about the UbiCloud code base. So the question is, uh, what embedding models does UbiCloud support? Um, let's see if I can get this to show up here. So it says that it supports um, OpenAI, Cohere, and Hugging Face, which is um, not accurate. Uh, 
Ruby Cloud supports Mistral as an embedding model, and uh, we'll be able to generate that answer with our chatbot uh, later. Um, where did my mouse go? So, the way that we're going to solve this is with RAG, or Retrieval Augmented Generation. So basically, um, it's a process where you store a corpus of information, such as a code base, you retrieve relevant context from that store, and you pass that context to the LLM to help answer questions. So in the earlier example, we'd want to fetch all the files that are related to embeddings, and then pass those uh, files to the LLM to help it uh, answer the question. Um, so, how vectors and AI uh, play into this? Um, so, uh, it's hard to compare files uh, automatically and seeing like whether or not they're related to a certain concept. And um, embedding models and vectors let you map uh, similar items to vectors that are close together. So it gives you a definition of similarity, like an actual way to compare text. Um, so what we're gonna do is, for each file, we're going to generate a vector from it. We're gonna store those vectors in a code base, Postgres, uh, database, Postgres, and we're gonna use ve vector search uh, to find related files to a question. Um, we'll have one more intermediate step in the middle where we actually first uh, generate a summary of the file with an LLM and then convert that to a vector. Um, so the reason is just that it condenses the information in the file uh, to, uh, a shorter form that makes it easier to run similarity search. Um, so specifically for the LLM, we'll use the Llama 3, uh, 3 billion model on UbiCloud, and we'll use the uh, Mistral 7B uh, embedding model on UbiCloud. Um, and Lantern will handle automatically generating the LLM column and automatically generating the vector column on your behalf. Um, so let's build this with Lantern on UbiCloud. So at a high level, what we're going to do is we're going to create the database on UbiCloud, uh, create the schema, uh, load the database into, uh, sorry, load the repo into the database, so load all the files one by one, and then we'll have uh, Lantern automatically generate the LLM column and the vector column, and then we'll be able to ask, uh, and ask questions. Uh, so the code is at that repo, and I'll switch to mirroring. No. Cool. Um, so, let's see. I'll largely be following the README, so uh, if you're interested, feel free to check out the repo after. Um, so, we'll create the database um, on ubicloud.com, um, and it's pretty easy. I went ahead and created a few in advance, um, but you can just uh, click Create Lantern Postgres Database on ubicloud.com. Um, then you will set your environment variables, so like database URL, OpenAI API key, and so forth, and load them into the environment. And we can connect to the database. Um, a few configuration things, uh, so enabling uh, uh, the LLM generation feature and uh, adding the API key. So, first up, uh, like I mentioned before, is just to create the database schema. So we have a files table. Yes, it's empty, so nothing is inside, so. Um, there's a few automatic uh, tables, but other than that, the files table is empty. Um, so we'll load the data. So we make a directory called uh, repos where we clone the GitHub uh, repo. And we'll, basic, we'll run process repo, and what that does is just load every single uh, file into the database. So now when we go back, um, let's do select name from files. you'll be able to see the file names. And as before, it's still the same schema, repo, name, code, and ID. Next, we will add the um, LLM job. So basically what you provide as input is the table name, the source column, the output uh, 
column. So in our case, we're taking the files table, we're taking the code column and generating a description and giving it a system prompt. So if you're a helpful code assistant, you will receive code from a file and you will summarize what the code does, including specific interfaces where helpful. And it'll output a uh, text type and we'll, uh, so this is just explaining the uh, API. So you choose the model and the batch size. Um, in our case, we will go with the uh, Llama uh, 3 billion model. So this is uh, creating the uh, LLM job. And you'll, you can check the status of that job here. And you can see that it's in progress. There's about 600 files. Um, similarly, we can create the embedding job. So uh, we take the files table, we take the description column that we just gener generated earlier. Uh, we take, we're going to generate a vector column and use, uh, we'll input a model, and uh, similarly a batch size for how many embeddings we're generating at the same time. Uh, so in this case, we are using the Mistral model. And we can have that uh, run in parallel. So uh, basically, um, these API calls take quite a long time for embedding generation, for LLM calls. For 600 files, it can take a minute per file. But if you can parallelize it, everything is quite a bit faster. Um, so earlier, I showed you how to do get completion jobs, uh, get embedding jobs, and we can see um, if there's any uh, descriptions that have already been generated yet. Okay. Um, it takes about a minute, so I think it just hasn't finished yet. Um, but afterwards, we'll be able to uh, run the chatbot to ask questions. Um, so one question that we can ask is, uh, what embedding models does UbiCloud support? So we asked that earlier, and um, let's see. So. You can ask basic questions like, what is this repo? And uh, we have OpenAI and Llama side by side just to sanity check, but most of the things work quite well. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so, um, okay. Sorry, I was waiting for the answer. So basically, uh, in the first row, we have just uh, questions that are asked without any additional context. So uh, basically, whatever the LLM has already been trained on, whatever's publicly available. Um, so it has uh, some, it sounds plausible, but yeah, I, I, this is not accurate. For example, uh, UbiCloud's code base is largely in Ruby. Um, and similarly, you can read deeper into this. Um, in contrast with context, it's able to uh, go more into the actual uh, details behind what the repo is doing. So um, in this case, we'll ask the earlier question of what embedding models does UbiCloud support? Um, this is the OpenAI response completely made up, just listing a bunch of embedding models that do exist but are not specific to UbiCloud and, not, and are not supported there. Um, so similarly, Llama doesn't have context here, so it gives a made up answer as well. Um, okay, there's a little bit of stochasticity, which is a bit annoying. Um, Okay, there's a bit of stochasticity, stochasticity but um, here we can see that it generates the same model uh, that we used in the code. So it was able to generate an accurate answer. Um, going back to the slides. Um, oops. Okay. 
Um, so that was just a demo on how to build a LLM uh, chatbot over uh, a code base. So um, that was a fairly simple example. Uh, we are only querying over about 600 files, um, but if you're trying to fully support code base QA, you probably want to improve it by breaking down files into functions, by adding information about commits, by pulling in docs, by pulling in maybe other code bases. So you'll eventually start adding more and more information and you might start having performance issues. Um, so with this, you might have heard of PG Vector. PG Vector is let to uh, create a HNSW index to improve performance for vector queries. Um, you can also do parallel index creation for larger indexes. Um, there's a caveat that uh, vector indexes are very large com compared to other indexes like gin indexes or B-tree. Um, if you think about it, vectors are often over a thousand uh, dimensions and uh, 32, containing 32-bit float numbers. So it gets co quite large. Um, and it also takes a lot of uh, compute to create these indexes, especially for uh, larger data sets. Um, so Lantern supports using external in uh, resources to create the index. Uh, so that lets you arbitrarily scale indexing resources. So for example, you can have a one CPU database with, and then use 100 CPUs to create the index and then import that index back into Postgres. So uh, you can do everything much faster. Um, in general, in general um, so you have uh, serverless indexing to make everything faster, but um, you also benefit from uh, NVMe on UbiCloud. So NV NVMe is basically a new storage protocol that makes retrieval from disk faster. So if you have a very large data set, sometimes your index doesn't fit in memory, and this leads to poor performance because the index is on disk and you have to do retrievals. Um, but because of NVMe, the equivalent uh, vector operations can be two to six times faster on UbiCloud. And on top of that, UbiCloud uh, still costs about 30% less than um, uh, the major cloud providers like uh, AWS and GCP. So on a price performance basis, it's about three to nine times fast, uh, better than uh, the major cloud providers. Um, so in sum, uh, you can build qu quite complex applications with only Postgres. You don't need to have a separate AI-specific database like Pinecone. Um, and you can do this at about 10 times lower cost versus Pinecone uh, if you're doing, let's say, like 10 queries per second. Um, and this is with a dedicated Postgres instance as opposed to uh, Pinecone, which is a, a bit bursty, it's serverless, and has um, worse uh, performance due to that. Um, we were able to automatically generate embeddings and uh, LLM outputs using Postgres, and all of this was done open source uh, without lock-in. So all of the embedding models were open source, all of the LLM models and uh, Postgres extensions and UbiCloud, of course. Um, so uh, that's a summary of uh, building an LLM chatbot with uh, Postgres, and I'll hand it over to Umer. Uh, thank you, Lee. Mm -hmm. Since we are kind of ahead of time, maybe this is a good time to pause uh, and take some questions uh, if you have any. Uh, yes. Uh, Heidi, could you go back to the chat uh, box application that you demoed and uh, share a bit more? Like you had yeah. no context, you had context. Is there yeah. like more stuff in there? Maybe you talk yeah. us through it a bit more. Like what does yeah, that mean? Yeah, yeah. So this was just meant to be a demo. So basically, um, uh, we sub I indexed a couple of repos, so PG Cron, Citus, and UbiCloud. Um, and so you can p give it a question, and what happens is it compares um, multiple things. So if we just focus on the right, uh, right column, it compares what Llama model can respond without any additional context. So it doesn't know anything uh, about the UbiCloud repo other than what it was trained on, let's say, six months ago. Um, and in this case, you are providing additional context. So we're providing files that uh, we think might be relevant to um, the question, so files that we thought were related to embeddings in this case. And then uh, at the bottom, we show uh, the actual context that was fetched uh, using vector search from Postgres. Um, so uh, the initial question was what embedding models does UbiCloud support? And um, let's see. 
Okay, so it pulled in the context from one of the commit messages from Ben of introducing a new uh, model. So uh, that was, yeah, so that's a summary of how uh, this works and it's also available um, in a related repo. I'll add it to the main repo shortly. And I'm uh, the inclined to take a bit of a risk uh, live, I don't know, I mean, uh, not a big risk, but uh, can you go to chat GPT just uh, and uh, ask the same question on uh, on here, just the public, because, right. yeah, I, now this has access to the web, this is the, called the ultimate consumer experience, this, and everything about UV Cloud is open source, so it, it is available, uh, and it, there you go, like it makes stuff up. That's the hallucination problem. And not to say the other model doesn't make any hallucinations. But I mean, we're building kind of almost a toy app and the size of the models are, uh, like OpenAI is hundreds of billions of parameters uh, and new models are trillion parameters and so forth. And the, the little llama model we have is about three billion uh, you know, parameters. So it's much, much smaller. The, of course, the reason it can give a more accurate answer is the context that D kind of has talked about. Um, and so, yeah, I, I find this kind of uh, fascinating. The, um, so this now applies, in this case, UbiCloud is uh, public data, like all the code is uh, public, but you could imagine in your organization you have private data that you're less kind of open to giving to OpenAI and perhaps uh, doing it on a, you know, like a llama model could both give you better results, lower cost and more privacy, almost all of those uh, together. Um, and also, out of curiosity, what was the cutoff uh, date for like the no context one? Can we go to our other window and just ask that as a question? You mean here? Uh, no, oh. like on the, oh, no, no, uh, like, yeah, uh, on our uh, demo, no, demo app, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, like if we ask uh, what, what was your training cutoff date or something? So for no context, it's October, about a year old, so it won't have much info about UbiCloud because a lot of it is built over the past year. Likewise, Llama, I mean, uh, has a December context, but then once we have context, and in the case of a web app, you, don't, you not only have context, but you have access to crawling the web with Bing and so forth, the experience gets richer, but the problem still is there. So quality matters, and there's, this is a way to, to tackle it. Before you, is there anybody else? <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, um, is the Llama model um, specifically trained for compilers or programming languages? Is there an optimization on that or would it produce somewhat it's, better results for all kinds of different... It's a general stuff. model that was produced by Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That was good. Yeah. Uh, Follow-on question. Uh, maybe the, if you could scroll down to the... Yes, with context prompt. So, and I'm trying to tie this over to how uh, the data is stored in Lantern. Like, uh, the data is, like, represented in Lantern and Postgres. Could you talk a bit more about that, like the data representation within the database and extension? Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah. So the data is stored in uh, just a normal table. So uh, we store the vectors as a real array and the description as text. So um, you can see the description that was generated um, from uh, files where description. Oh, the type of, no. Ah. Uh. Llama limit. Okay, so here's an example of a des uh, description that was generated. And uh, so this is what we pass into the Llama model. Um, but in terms of searching for uh, relevant context, uh, we use the vector, which is also um, in the stored table. 
that might not show because it's quite long. Um, but yeah, so uh, it just uh, goes through all of the vectors and finds the vectors that are most similar to uh, a, a vector representation of your question. So the question was, what embedding models does UbiCloud support? And then we generated a vector of that and queried against what was available in the database. Uh, you showed us the repo that are all text files and then all the process was going on. Uh, what about not text files, not native text files? So where is this piece of extraction? Um, uh, could you clarify what you mean by non-text files? Do you mean like images or? Oh yeah, um, so, um, so PDF, for example, is generally converted to text that can then be processed in a similar way. Um, images can be can have their own uh, vector embedding models as well, um, but uh, generally uh, the LLMs do best with uh, so somehow getting that into a text out output that the embedding model can work. Sorry, the LLM can work with. Yeah, and then the, some models are image specific, some are multi-model, so you can you know process them. Uh, but Llama specifically is text-based. All right. Uh, shall we continue? Um, yeah. right, thank you. So in this part, I'll just kind of talk about, we built a, a toy app, although we did kind of build it from scratch with some pre-prepared scripts that scraped uh, our files and put them there, but a lot of it is, you know, uh, like already done, but how does this fit into your existing Postgres uh, setup? And to do that, uh, I want to take kind of a walk in memory lane, if you will, and talk about some of the lessons we learned and then kind of how we apply them to, to today. So uh, we've been running uh, and or building or, or both uh, Postgres extensions uh, and running them in the cloud as a service for more than, a, more than 10 years now. Uh, and, uh, you know, at our journey kind of at Citus, the way we started was, okay, we're going to build a purpose-built DBAS service, Postgres as a service. Uh, from scratch to you know serve our extension, which is which is Citus, uh, and in fact uh, the you know team that kind of joined us to do that was from Heroku, and one of the members of that team, Daniel, uh, who you know uh, wrote Heroku Postgres quite quite a bit of it at least, uh, is one of our co-founders at at UbiCloud. So we we you know we took that, uh, and you know it worked for us ultimately, uh, you know in terms of market traction and usage and everything. But it's hard, and not only for the, you know, the extension authors, because those are two separate expertise areas, you know, running it and then building the extension, but also from the customer's point of view, like, okay, Citus worked, and then there's time scale as a also very kind of uh, broadly adopted successful extension, but will I use a separate DBAS for every separate extension out there? And then that makes the story harder to, to adopt for customers, uh, so that was, uh, you know, one, one big limitation of that approach. Um, and of course, you know, when we made Citus into a Postgres extension, that was 2015, right? So it's almost, uh, you know, that was new uh, back then to kind of transform a, the database to an entire different workload, but now it's more and more common. And I'll touch up more and more examples. Then post the acquisition uh, at uh, Microsoft, we had a different challenge, which is now we're running the Azure Postgres service, and there is, of course, you know, tens of different extensions that are supported. Some are reasonably like straightforward, and you see them on all kind of cloud services, like on RDS, uh, but some are much more involved. An example was Timescale. So we took the community version, we made it available on Azure, and it worked for some, but the problem is, you know, the customer once has a question about how it operates, and we don't know all the ins and outs of how a time scale does. So it's very hard to respond to that question. It's also not good for the authors of the extension because they're disconnected from the customer. So you jump on a joint support bridge, like the customer is frustrated, and, and you can't really help them succeed, and it's just uh, you know, a broken experience. Uh, and, and so that's what we have for, for the most part, a generic Postgres service with you know, uh, some extensions running on top. And over all these years, we've kind of realized, hey, there's actually a better way to do this, which is we're gonna combine the first part, the expertise, what uh, Dee just talked about, like uh, her knowledge and her team's knowledge of you know, AI is at a level that's gonna be different than, you know, just 
the Postgres knowledge, and vice versa, right? Like we know the ins and outs of Postgres, how to upgrade it, how to back it up to HA, to security patch it, all of those things you expect. We know well from our uh, days, uh, from Citus, from Heroku, from Azure, uh, and, and others. So let's combine them, but not just combine them as a, as a tick box, but when the customer, as you, for example, provision a Lantern database in the way that Lee was showing, uh, you immediately interface with the, that extension team, in this case, Lantern. So when you have a question, it doesn't go to us. It first goes to the Lantern team for support. You say, okay, my indexes uh, took slower than I realized. What should happen? You know, I have an external, external service. Those are things they are best equipped to answer. So that's how we, uh, you know, uh, brought this uh, together. Uh, and in fact, you know, Lantern, uh, what we spoke about is, uh, you know, one of those extensions, ParadeDB is another. Um, and um, what ParadeDB does, maybe a quick show of hands, anybody familiar uh, with ParadeDB? They're a very new company. Okay, so a few hands up, yes. Uh, and uh, what they do is uh, like Elasticsearch, like uh, full text search on Postgres. So again, it transforms Postgres from its kind of uh, standard usage, if you will, into more elastic search, both syntax-wise and functionality-wise. Uh, and then same thing, you can provision a Parade DB instance on UbiCloud, uh, and then the support tickets, anything you open will go to the Parade DB team, so you're dealing with the experts in that area. So we think this is a much better way to run extensions in Postgres in general um, for, for everyone involved. Um, now, that's... One thing, the other is, okay, regardless of who's running it, where does this thing sit? Uh, and of course, like if you're building an entirely new app from scratch, you can just provision it on UbiCloud, uh, you know, put your AI database, you can serve your production workload together with your you know, uh, AI workloads in the same database. Or if your Postgres is already somewhere else, which presumably for everyone here, that there's, uh, you know, there's a Postgres somewhere. It could be on-prem, it could be on RDS, on AWS could be Azure, uh, doesn't matter. You keep it as is, but because this is Postgres to Postgres and not Postgres to Pinecone or Postgres to some other vector database, the means of moving the data is very easy. You can use logical replication, which we call supports. You could do PG dump restore. You could you know, like copy the files if you want. You could keep the data in sync. Uh, and so it becomes a lot easier so you don't disturb your production app, uh, which uh, you know, don't, you know, many reasons to not do that, but then you have now created some of that data, you've maybe added new data like we did in the demo, and now you have an AI endpoint, and you can iterate quickly uh, with it. So that's how we kind of uh, see a lot of the, the usage patterns. Does that, uh, any questions? Maybe a quick uh, uh, pause there. Is that all what resonate? All right, now. Since this is uh, where things are running, uh, I want to uh, take the last uh, section of the talk to talk about, okay, where actually uh, are all of these instances are running, and let's peel the onion a little bit to see what's kind of underneath the, the, you know, the surface. So um, this is the kind of ana anatomy of a very high-level uh, generic kind of AI uh, service. You have a database service, could be Postgres, could be something else. Then you have an LLM service, this kind of endpoint. And here I'm talking about inference, meaning like we're not doing the training of the models and so forth, which is a separate workload. The picture isn't much different, but you know, very uh, specific to, to our topic here. And then you could have an LLM service, you could have an image service, uh, like uh, the, the model, you could have an embedding uh, service that sits somewhere, right? And you take those, you store them, the application talks to the database and things work. Now, Underneath that, what makes that happen is for your, of course, database service, there is a database, in this case, say, Postgres. Underneath that, it runs on a VM. Uh, that VM sits on top of a, uh, some bare metal somewhere. Uh, and then that's virtualized. Uh, there's a hypervisor, there's an operating system. So that's your full stack of uh, a managed Postgres instance. Now, that, uh, it's uh, held together, if you will, by, the, by a control plane. And what the, what the control plane does is, uh, you know, it orchestrates the entire service, right? It, ex instantiates, it detects failures, you know, it spins new instances up uh, and all of that. Uh, and every cloud service has a variant of this, right? If you go AWS, it's all proprietary, then, you know, uh, same thing with, in fact, any cloud service. Azure has their own, you know, control, uh, uh, like logic and, and, and plane 
Google has and, and as does UbiCloud, right? So that's the control plane. Uh, and then on the LLM side, the same story, but the bare metal, of course, now is GPUs. Uh, and on top of that, you virtualize it. And now to serve inference, there is a, you know, an inference engine um, there are the different companies that provide proprietary kind of engines of it, but this is what you know, like serves the model. And then on top of it is you have the model itself, right? So you have, uh, it could be Llama, it has weights, it has, uh, you know, um, like it's, it's origin logic like the uh, open AI models. So in this case, um, as you might have guessed, and then this is something we care a lot about at UbiCloud, when we say we're an open source alternative to AWS, this is, uh, we go like everything that you see here is open, open source. So from the metal all the way to the application. And it's up to you to decide if you wanna make the application open source as well or not. That, of course, we have no you know, purview over. But everything that we have uh, is, is open source. So uh, there's a cloud hypervisor. If you use that at the virtualization layer together with you know, Linux, of course, and, and, and KVM. On top of that is Postgres, uh, with, without which, you know, uh, we wouldn't be here. Like, I wouldn't be on the stage. We kind of owe, owe a lot to the, to the community, to the project, but that's the big elephant. And uh, next to it is Lantern. Lantern is also open source. So that's your database stack. And similarly, you know, you have the GPUs. On top of that, you have the virtualization. You, there's a, a project called VLLM, which is moving at a phenomenal pace. Uh, that's open source, so that's what we use for our inference engine. Uh, and then our models for embedding is Mistral, uh, you know, a kind of French company, and this model is, is open source, and we have Llama from, uh, from the Meta team. Uh, we have the smaller models that we used on this demo, the 3 billion model, the latest version, 3.2, but the smallest model. Uh, there is a, you know, 7 billion uh, parameter, and there's a 405 billion parameter version of Llama, which is kind of comparable in many benchmarks to, you know, chat GPT, like OpenAI. Uh, and that model is actually also supported by UbiCloud, just not yet released. So this, this picture is uh, like what's, what's under the hood. So we think this is uh, important, not just from a, hey, like this is open source and cool, but this is like you get to see, uh, you know, what's, uh, how it's running. There's a transparency angle to it. Uh, there's also a portability angle to it, like this stack can run anywhere. You could take this and you could run it, imagine like running it on a different data center or you could technically also even run this on AWS if you wanted to. Like, uh, now it wouldn't give you the, the cost benefit because AWS bare metal costs almost as much as you know, EC2, uh, but you would get you know, a bunch of other benefits. Fundamentally though, this is, uh, everything is open. What's more, uh, everything is in Europe. So the left-hand side of this are CPU, uh, you know, machines are like on in Falcon, Falkenstein, I think I butcher the, the pronunciation, but so that's, uh, that's in Germany. Uh, and then our GPUs are between you know, Falkenstein again and, and, and Frankfurt. And it's really very actually quick for us to open up new regions because again, this is all designed with that in mind. We have other regions kind of in the US, so like US in Virginia next to US East, about one millisecond away if you're on the other side of the ocean. So the same kind of logic applies. Uh, if you do that, of course, your data is in the US. You, but that's a choice you deliberately make as opposed to we make for you. Um, all right, so I think that wraps things up. Um, wanna kind of reflect on the, the main things we covered uh, during the talk today. So first, uh, Lantern on UbiCloud makes it easy to build an LLM chatbot or more broadly build AI applications uh, on your data, all in Postgres, and whether your data is public or private. Uh, it makes it probably easier than, uh, than you might think. Of course, every person has a different context, but uh, we did it in, in about 15 minutes today, a, a toy version. Number two, uh, what you build uh, gives you anywhere from 3x uh, to almost 9x the price performance advantage to using, uh, you know, like vectors in Postgres. Vectors in Postgres aren't, you know, just unique to Lantern. You could do that with the PG vector. You could, like, there is, uh, like, ways to do that. But uh, taking that as a baseline, for example, RDS with PG vector or, you know, Cloud SQL with PG vector, the value is very real, partly because of NVMe, partly because of the, you know, the adjustments we make uh, to the code. So that's number two. Uh, number three is, okay, stepping out, Postgres is an AI database, as opposed to a general purpose, uh, you know, relational database. 
uh, actually scales quite well. We haven't touched on that part in deep, and then like Lantern team has some blog posts and detailed information about that. But you know, you can take this from the like 900 or so files we had to like millions of um, like embeddings and millions of rows to hundreds of millions even. Uh, and one of the bigger criticisms of Postgres in this context was, okay, you need to create indexes to serve this thing well, but indexes are very uh, memory intensive uh, for, for this, for vectors. Uh, and then you have to over-provision your Postgres just to make sure that indexes fit in memory, your cost bloat and all of that. But all of those are solvable problems. And in this case, like index creation through Lantern is done by an external service. So your Postgres remains you know, dedicated to Postgres, but spin up new compute, calculate the, you know, like do the, create the indexes, we write them back to Postgres. All of that is done automatically. Like you don't have to worry about that. And the, the net result is this actually scales quite nicely to, to large scale, to, to production apps. Number four is that the, in, within UbiCloud Postgres, we have a unique way of offering extensions. Uh, and by unique, I mean, I think we're the only company that does that, uh, like in the world. Uh, where we partner, we curate specific areas where we care deeply about Postgres, and that comes from our experience uh, with Citus and with Postgres over the past many years. Um, and then we give access uh, to both of the, those pieces of expertise, both uh, the extension and, and the Postgres operations, uh, so that you don't have to worry about any of those things and you just iterate on the app. That's number four. Number five, uh, all of this, everything we talked about from end to end is open source. Uh, the, and uh, not just that, but it's, uh, everything is in Europe. So that's something for privacy concerns or others uh, worth mentioning. And the last thing is, uh, well, maybe you didn't mention it just yet, but you can test all of this today. It's not like a, a lab environment. Uh, everything is available. And you can do so without impacting your production database. The cost uh, to do so, uh, I think starts at about $97 a month, is what we said, on the, with the Lantern and UbiCloud service, but that's billed minutely. So like for a, like an hour, it's about like 14 cents. So you could spin up an instance, you could use it for a couple of days, and it'll cost you about three, six dollars, right? Uh, and that aside, like it's very accessible, easy to try. For uh, anyone who's interested in uh, trying it, we are happy to actually give credits to say, okay, like 20,000 minutes, just email us, support at uh, ubicloud.com uh, or support at lantern.ai, either works, and then we'll, uh, you know, give those minutes, just add them to your account to, to kick the tires. And let us know what you think. You know, you said, hey, this worked well, this didn't work well, uh, all of it is valuable to us. Um, and yeah, we look forward to hearing what you'll build with it. Thank you. And I guess we will have many questions. Yeah, thanks. So uh, one thing that uh, Lantern makes I didn't know about is that you can actually offload the index creation to an external process, right? Which, uh, which is smart, right? I, I get that. Uh, what yeah. I have found from my experience, though, is, uh, OK, index creation can be slow, but it uh, can be faster. What about the scenario where I need some extra CPU time to offload this for the actual the creation of the embeddings, right? So once you have the embeddings, okay, you can speed up the index creation. But does UbiCloud have any idea of, you know, any offering of sorts that, okay, I have a server like a beefy Postgres service in, in Hessner, right? Um, I have 60 million uh, documents. Yeah. I only need some CPU time for the actual, for a few hours because with my CPU time available, it will take like five or six months to populate my database. So I would like some extra CPU time just for the embedding creation, not the actual indexing side. Um, I'll answer based on what I think you're asking. So uh, if I got something wrong, let me know. But um, so uh, the embedding generation itself is not happening inside the Postgres database. So it's not, the embedding generation isn't taking database resources. What's going on is that, uh, let's say you have a million uh, rows to generate vectors for. Um, we'll make uh, AP, uh, API calls to UbiCloud or to OpenAI or whatever embedding model you use uh, to generate those vectors. And um, so I think OpenAI allows up to 
uh, 50,000 vectors per minute or something like that. So uh, we'll uh, let you take advantage of uh, the maximum amount of parallelism there. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, but uh, it's main like kind of feature request or something for UbiCloud, right? So I use Xena, for example, right? So yeah. I, if I use my existing code base, like, it will take me like five or six months to populate my existing data. So I haven't found any provider who would actually, you know, give me some CPU time for the actual creation of the embeddings. So that's maybe like a feature request, actually. To create the embeddings in EBCloud, yes. you mean? Yes. Yeah. The uh, yeah. I mean, we have we have the endpoint. Uh, so like when we de deploy the Mistral model on, so it would be a, like happy to have a conversation. Say perhaps like for your account, we increase the uh, you know like the limit. Yeah. But then, of course, like, yeah, like we're happy to, to have a you know, conversation about that. For what it's worth, I, I think in my experience, the genome model has been particularly slow to generate embeddings for. Yeah, but if you, it's probably the most decent one for non-English text. Mm. So that's the main thing. Yeah, yeah, that's accurate. Especially the V3 version, it's normal. Any other questions? Uh, do you also use like lake houses, you says, from other sources, other clouds, so you can take unstructured data and use that for the uh, AI model? And if so, can you also make BI from your platform for that data? Is, is the question, can we take other sources of unstructured data? Yeah, embeddings and BI. Yeah, it's entirely up to the application. So like this is uh, whatever, you, you could scrape the web and put some information into the database. You could take your PDF documents, you could take other data, and whatever you put in Postgres will reside there, and then through Lantern you'll just create embeddings for it. So mm -hmm. the data, collection of data, we leave uh, to the application. Does that answer your question? I was. Ah, I see. Can you have it reside uh, elsewhere? Yeah, like in S3 and S3. In S3? Um, so something we support, for example, is you can store a image URL in your Postgres database, and we can automatically generate an image embedding for you. Uh, so you don't have to have like the full image in your uh, database. Um, I, I don't think we have support for, uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what that would look like, to be honest. I, I think I, I can't quite grasp it. Maybe, so you're asking, hey, like, through, right now, I, if I, it's like you would download that to Postgres, like from S3, and then kind of process it. Is there a way to do it with, like, foreign data wrappers or reaching, you know, without moving the data? Is that your question? Like, to create embeddings for it, and that might be something uh, for us to sync, you know, so like big offline. Data yeah, like without storing everything yeah. in Postgres. Yeah, uh, data from many places, like yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's that might I don't know if that's possible today or uh, that's something to take as input. I yeah I, I don't think that's possible today, but uh. yeah, and and uh, to be honest, I think you know as a starting point, it might be more controllable to you know put data in and see how like things directly in, on Postgres behave. But for much larger data sets, for organizational wikis, like you have data scrolling everywhere, I think that's a rich topic to to talk through. So uh, regarding Ubi Cloud, uh, in your sales pitch, you uh -huh. uh, said how uh, Ubi Cloud has first-party support for extensions, yep. and uh, other uh, managed Postgres services don't have this. Um, I would ask, like, what is the trade-off? Why other uh, service managed services don't have such support? Yeah. And uh, what's better uh, in uh, competitors right. then? Right, right. Like, why why are we doing this and others not? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, there's a few reasons. One, um, when you put the, uh, like if you're running somebody's kind of like extension, there is a licensing conversation that needs to happen. Like if it's not 
part of why, for example, AWS couldn't run Mongo is, okay, you know, like, is the license compatible? Everything they have is closed source. So there is, there is, there is one limitation there. Beyond that, though, much more importantly, or much, I don't know if it's much more importantly, but also a very big consideration is, like we uh, had Citus in an Amazon marketplace back when we did Citus, we put it, and it would get usage, and what we get back would be some obscure ID, like customer ID, blah, blah, used Citus on this machine for this long. Like, what do I do with that information? I don't know who the customer is, I can't, so they're very protective of keeping the customer relationship. Uh, so it becomes very hard for the extension provider to say, okay, like I have usage, I have revenue, but I don't know who they are. So there's, it's kind of, you know, you're selling through a big box retailer, like a product, but you don't know who your customers are. That's part of the situation. Like in our case, we do explicitly, we pass on that request transparently. We ask you as a customer when you sign up to check a box and say, you look, when you spin up Lantern, uh, on UB Cloud, you're explicitly giving consent that your email is gonna be shared with the Lantern team. Uh, and that team will like, so that's an explicit choice we make. That choice is harder to make for the hyperscalers. Uh, those are two big reasons. There's more from a support structure and et cetera, but those are the biggest ones. Yes and no, so it depends on, it really depends on the extension, but uh, the types of ex extensions that are, I think, most interesting with the model that we're talking about are um, ones that are more complex, that basically address a particular workload for Postgres. It could be search, it could be AI, it could be analytics, uh, and they, those tend to sit well uh, next to the OLTP database. Right, so now you could have your UB Cloud runs in, like I said, US East. So you could have your RDS or GCP, whatever database in US East, and you could have your analytics database, search database, et cetera. In, right, so, but for us, so that's the, the kind of more involved part, but uh, also we are, uh, because we're very familiar with the, generally the Postgres system, then we can build those connections uh, in a good way and abstract the complexity from the customer. So in that sense, it's easier for us, in, 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 but it, th those are non-trivial extensions, if that makes sense. Yeah? Unfortunately, unfortunately, we run out of time, so I would like to ask for one more round of applause and remaining questions in the booth, please. Thank you.